the idea of having these intermediaries that effectively do everything on your behalf is philosophically an issue. And I think also maybe technically an issue as well, right? One of the earliest Bitcoin miners who was involved very, very early, he basically threw away one of the old hard drives he had, which he thinks now contained private keys to some of those early block rewards that he mined. So he thinks he's lost around 8,000 BTC. That's worth around 400 million today as we record this. This is the kind of thing that can happen if you go down the pure physical self-custody route, okay? You are responsible. And even someone as experienced and knowledgeable, it can still happen to them. It can happen to the best of us, right? Welcome to another episode of the Entangling Web3 podcast. Now, you may have heard the phrase, not your keys, not your coins before, which refers to the perceived risks of storing your digital assets on centralized exchanges. This gets to the heart of one of the biggest questions for everyday users of crypto, which is, how should I custody my assets to keep them secure? So today, we'll be taking a look at the different custody options available to crypto users and what you should consider when choosing one of them. Of course, as ever, I'm joined by my co-host, Alec, to dissect this topic. How are you today, my friend? Yeah, I'm very good. This is the question that's in the news on everyone's lips right now. All anyone is talking about is how do I store my keys, right? And how do I store my crypto? No, I'm joking. But with the recent boom in the crypto market right now, it is a hot topic. There are people that are coming into the space, a lot of newbies. Actually, I've been asked quite a lot in the last like couple of weeks. Is Even by one of my friends who's like you know, he's 60 plus, and this is, like I said, I've heard about this Bitcoin thing. Is it really a good way to invest? Like You were there, Jack, as well. And I was just like, okay, yeah, it's probably the time to maybe get involved in this stuff. But it is a question that a lot of people are asking. And I think it's really important to understand the different ways that we can actually store our keys and store our cryptocurrency, right? Yeah, it is a very important topic. Likewise, I've had the same experience for many years, people wanting to get some exposure to Bitcoin or other cryptos. And you might tell them, okay, well, there's this wallet to use. And then a year or two later, they say, oh, you know, that that crypto I bought, I can't seem to access it anymore. And then they can, they run into this exact problem you sometimes get when you hold your own keys. So yeah, why don't we just start off? I think it's worth just summarizing, okay, at a glance, what are we talking about? So In general, we as users of crypto, we have three options broadly when it comes to securing our assets. So firstly, you can use a custodial service. So, you know, that's a third party being fully responsible for storage and security management of your digital assets. Then you have what's called non-custodial services. That's when you still have a third party involved, but they actually allow you to maintain full control of your keys, the, the private keys that control your funds. And then you have self-custody, which is kind of a third option. It's very similar to non-custodial because it is non-custodial, but self-custody is when you're completely fully independent and it typically is more physical where your non-custodial services are digital. So yeah, that's the three kind of broad options unless you've heard of any other ways of holding your crypto recently. <laughs> no, I think they're the, the, the main three. I think I've experienced all three of them and probably experienced the pitfalls of all three of them as well. But it probably makes sense to go into each of them in a bit more detail, just so people understand what their options are, what the pros are, what the cons are, and hopefully enable them to make an educated decision on what's best for them if they start to move into this space. Yeah, exactly. So why don't we start with the first one then, the fully custodial option. So as we said, this is when you are effectively giving over the control of your assets to a third party. You're letting them safeguard them, the private keys that control spending the funds on the blockchain itself, or even on a layer two, as we've talked about recently, those keys effectively sit with that third party, right? Yeah. And I think one of the best analogies for this is like a bank, right? I think most people who aren't Jack Davis storing their cash under their mattresses tend to store all of their physical and digital cash with a third party, their bank, their Santander, the HSBCs of the world, right? And there's pros to this. The reason we do this is because we trust them. We trust they have the right security measures in place. We trust they have our interests at heart. We trust they're not going to mess around. And also who wants to store their cash under the bed? It tends to just be the Tim Four hat people of the world who think, doomsday is coming any minute and then we can't trust the government but i think most people understand the benefits of custodians when it comes to cash and it applies in the exact same way with crypto as well yeah i think you're getting at the whole customer experience there as well right the customer experience of using custodial service providers whether that be typically a crypto exchange for example and we'll get onto other types in a minute but the experience of managing crypto assets via a third-party custodian is 
by far and away superior just in terms of how easy it is. It's much easier to get the assets in the first place to offboard typically when things are going well. So yeah, for most people, you, that will be their first point of contact with the, the crypto world. And that makes sense. As you said, it's analogous to what we have in, in the traditional world. So yeah, it's no surprise to me how much they get used. And I feel like we're flogging uh, a dead horse here a little bit in that whenever we talk about the problem with Web3, it's always the user experience, right? You go onto the apps and we're going to get onto it a little bit. There's loads of issues with non-custodial. So I don't want to jump the gun, but I already am around seed phrasing and all this kind of stuff. But when you're looking at Coinbase of the world and downloading the app and getting involved, it's the exact same as interacting with, you know, a normal kind of stock exchange or something like this. And I think the custodial model is, as we kind of have said before, a more Web 2.5 because you're managing Web 3 assets in a way, these cryptocurrencies and NFTs and all this kind of stuff. But you're doing it in a Web 2 way. So whenever someone who's not Web 3 native or doesn't have that guy that was speaking to us the other day, the 60 plus year old who was asking about this, the first thing I said was go to Coinbase. That's a bit of you. Like they'll do all the hard stuff. You'll just be able to interact with the environment, but you won't have any of the burdens of all the Web 3 stuff that we're still trying to figure out. So yeah, I think it is necessary. We're going to talk about some of the shortfalls of this stuff, obviously, but I do think it's a necessary intermediary right now as people start to get familiar with this space. Yeah, 100%. And we've seen you know, things like Revolut is a good example of a, not a traditional bank, but a challenger bank, much more modern digital first. They were offering crypto products as well, ability to buy and sell via that, or you have your Robin Hood app as well. So yeah, there's very low friction for people to get involved in, in holding it. Now, how does it actually work, this idea of fully custodial services? So essentially, they have to do the security somewhere, and you really have to think carefully about which provider you use because you need to be confident that they're using the right security measures. But typically what they'll do is they'll use what's called cold storage. So those private keys that you never really see as a user in a custodial environment, they will still take those very, very seriously. They'll hold them in these cold storage environments. And what that means is essentially they're not exposed to the internet for most of the time. They're, they're in secure hardware, air gap from the internet typically until the point where they need to sign a transaction with them, move funds around. But again, you never see any of how that's managed on, on, on the user end as, as a customer of one of these services. But you kind of trust that it's happening in the back end. Yeah, and I think this is something I didn't know that we were going to come onto it this early, but it does make sense. So we have these terms like cold wallets and hot wallets, right? And you've touched on what a cold wallet is there. It's usually managed offline for enhanced security you know, against hacking, but a bit less convenient for, for frequent access, right? So you tend to prefer these cold storage solutions or cold wallet solutions, if you just mentioned there, for long-term storage and la large holdings, you know, the hodlers of the world, the people that don't actually intend to use Bitcoin every day. They tend to just, you know, look at what's happened in a year down the line see how much money they've made and then you have hot wallets which are on the contrary the opposite interconnected they're there for easy access transactions every day but much more vulnerable to online threats and scams right and people that actually want to use cryptocurrency for the intended original use case if we think about bitcoin being this peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system then that's a hot wallet. You want to actually be exchanging things every day, doing micropayments and all the wonderful and weird things that Jack and I are always fangirling about. So yeah, there's a big distinction there that we need to probably clarify as we go through because that will keep coming up. Yeah, it's a good point. And yeah, just generally, I think of cold storage or cold wallet as offline and hot wallet as online, right? So mm -hmm. obviously, if something's online, you are exposed to different kinds of risks because there are access points to that through the internet protocols that we know about. So one of the things that I'd also like to, to mention here is there's, there's distinctions within distinctions. There's different types of custodial services as well, right? There's the kind of the black and white way of thinking of it, where whenever I want to use Coinbase, Coinbase will effectively access my key and they'll do the transaction for me. So it's effectively they're the full service provider. They do everything whenever I want them to. But there's actually kind of these things in between as well. When we start to think about multi-signature, threshold signature, multi-party computation stuff. And this is a little bit, in between a custodial and a non-custodial arrangement, I'd say, we will definitely do full episodes going into these because these are really interesting topics around the space. But just at like quite a high level, they're, they're cryptographic techniques to enhance security by splitting up, say, signing tools to multiple parties. So whenever I want to, say, send one Bitcoin from me to Jack, instead of me having the whole of that key, I can actually say, I'll have a part of that key 
maybe Coinbase will have a part of that key and my mom will have a part of that key as well. And, you know, on the one hand, that makes it more secure because you have to compromise my key, Coinbase's key, and potentially even my mom's key to do any transaction. But maybe the, the debt, which is good, good on the security perspective. The downside of that could be that all three parties need to agree every time. So you might not be able to do that, you know, at 20 times per second and things like this. But I mean, I know you're interested in these topics as well. Is there stuff you'd want to add there on the, the threshold signature, the multi-party stuff? Yeah, I think it's really interesting and it's becoming very, very commonplace now to use this multi-signatures or a threshold cryptography. So multi-signatures is, is the easiest to grasp, as you were saying. And there's an analogy with if you've ever worked in a corporate environment in the finance department, maybe for any big financial decision you make, payroll happening or end of month bills being paid by a company, you'll typically have a kind of double, triple, quadruple stamping going on from different people in the company. Your CFO, mm. your CEO will both have to agree before the transaction goes ahead. So multi-signature is just like that. So for a given transaction, you need multiple people to sign. And then the threshold cryptography basically is a bit more magic and takes that a step further <laughs> where things are even more secure in the MPC environment or this threshold environment where the keys don't actually exist. So these private keys that we say are in hot or cold storage, this is taking it one step further where they kind of never exist and take our word for it. This is magic. It's mathematics, but it's real. And it's really interesting. So lots of the bigger providers are experimenting and using these techniques now. Yeah, we definitely. I'm glad you just described it as magic because we definitely need a whole episode to go into some of the, the detail yeah. of that. But for now, we'll just say it is magic. These are very cool. There's lots of people that are exploring these. And there's so many more applications that threshold signatures and multi-party computation could be used for than just managing crypto and crypto wallets. But yeah, it's very secure, very interesting, but there are some downsides to it as well. So yeah, most kind of exchanges that are actually doing this kind of custodial arrangement the big ones that everyone's probably familiar with the coinbase of the world i mean that's the provider i use just because i've always thought of them as the most regulatory friendly like they've been working with the us for a long time i think they're probably the least likely to go under that's always been my understanding of coinbase anyway you've got the krakens of the world i mean i use kraken for a, i use kraken for a little while and i know they they do custodial arrangements right but i think they also do non-custodial arrangements as well i think you have the option for both and the reason i know that is because i actually had a kraken non-custodial wallet which we talked about previously and i lost coins on that maybe we'll talk about that a bit later in the next section yeah exactly and it's true that most of the centralized exchanges that do implement the custodial model are actually offering their customers the option to go non-custodial as well. So it's not just black and white. If you name a given provider, typically most are trying to offer both options. You also have other examples of dedicated custodians. So those crypto exchanges are more for your end consumers, like you or I just trying to buy, hold, sell, whatever your, your crypto assets. Then you have the dedicated custodians like a BitGo, for example, or a Fireblocks who've really become very huge recently, actually. They're much more focused on institutions. So if a, if a big company, as we talked about in the recent episode on adoption, if they want to start adding these assets to their balance sheet, they don't necessarily want to worry about all the security implications themselves. They'll use one of these dedicated custodians like a BitGo to do that for them. And they're the ones actually like your BitGo's Fireblocks who are doing a lot of this interesting threshold MPC stuff. Then mm. finally, not necessarily a custodian, but I think it's worth mentioning given what we're seeing at the minute, ETFs as well. So we talked about the fact that that's a way of getting price exposure to things like Bitcoin now, but you never actually hold the assets. And in that case, you don't actually own the asset necessarily. You own a share in this fund, but it's a similar idea. And in that case, the funds themselves, they're the ones who are doing custody of the underlying assets themselves. Yeah, I mean, I see like all these ETFs, like they kind of they split the Web3 and the crypto and definitely the maybe the Bitcoin maxi community to an extent where half the people were saying this is great institutional adoption. Boom, look, everything, all the money's going to flow in and everything's rocketing like it is now. And then the other half was like, well, no, this is really anti Web3, like the term that I think we've already touched on that we say often here as kind of something that's popular, not necessarily that we agree with it, but it's something that's very popular in the space is not your keys, not your coins. It kind of goes against the principle 
principles of Web3, which is all about individual ownership, empowerment. You know, we've talked about data sovereignty and all this kind of stuff. And the idea of having these intermediaries that effectively do everything on your behalf is philosophically an issue. And I think also maybe technically an issue as well. Like we've seen some of the how it can go wrongs very, like very recently. FTX, like a lot of people used in FTX. That was the poster boy, right? Kind of just spoke about Coinbase being like one of the golden boys. But FTX was actually probably as much, if not more so, as Coinbase and so many, so much money was lost there. So many normal people, not just the big investors, but you know, retail investors like you or I, they lost a lot of money as well. Now they're still trying to work out if they can get it back. Yeah, this phrase, not your keys, not your coins. I've always had a problem with it because I don't like how what implications it has in terms of property rights. I don't agree with the phrase in terms of if you don't have the keys, you don't own the property. I disagree with that. But in a very practical sense, it is true. As you said, things like FTX, if we go back even further, so many years ago, one of the first big exchange collapses, Quadriga, that collapsed. The exchange was basically being run off one guy's laptop and it ended up losing 200 million in customer funds. The guy disappeared, right? So this is the kind of thing. And even when you don't have malicious actors, we've just seen very recently with, with Bitcoin hitting all-time highs, Coinbase had issues at that time because of the surge in demand. And that led to, I think, around 100 billion being wiped off the crypto markets Whoa. purely because of the lack of service. So it's not just that the providers themselves might be malicious in any way. It's, it's purely the fact that technical issues can arise and that can affect you as a user. Yeah. And one thing I want to say is I am so surprised you didn't give the example for countering not your keys, not your coins. Jack loves talking about this. this is his favorite story. It was like, well, if I'm a car owner and someone takes the keys to my car or takes the keys to my house, it doesn't mean they own it. But um, you've actually avoided that for once, probably because we've got other things to talk about. Yeah, the Coinbase one's really interesting because it, I, I was part of the issues. I look at my Coinbase account maybe every day, something like this. And the error that was coming through because of all this activity was that a lot of people's wallets were reporting zero. So I looked at my Coinbase account. It was non-zero at 8 p.m. I look at it at 9 p.m. at zero. I'm like, oh my God, have I been hacked? Has Coinbase done an FTX wow. and disappeared? I was literally like on the phone to my girlfriend being like, we're screwed. Sorry, I've got no money left, <laughs> which is so ridiculous. Yeah, not financial advice. Do not do what Alec yeah, does and, yeah. and pour all your money into crypto. But yeah, it, it, it's true. These things can happen. And yeah, I won't go into the whole property rights thing. That is a whole other issue. But I think it's totally fair to think of it as not your keys, not your coins from purely practical means, as you say, mm. with FTX. You know, people have lost money. They probably won't get it back. There are other issues as well in the centralized exchange world and kind of with this custodial model. I don't think it's KYC is an issue, but some people see it as an issue. And the fact that you have to do KYC checking sometimes, actually the bigger issue is that there can be big data breaches. These are huge kind of targets, these exchanges and, and other providers are big targets for hackers, right? So there's been huge data breaches. In 2023, there was one exchange where a million customers' personal data was leaked, right? Because they know how many, how many customers they have and maybe mm -hmm. the security provisions aren't as good for the customer data as they are for the private key. So that's another issue people have with tying the, their ownership to one of these exchanges. Yeah. And I take your point about KYC. Like I am also you know, pro KYC. I think as we kind of move into the real world and we need to start actually you know, being able to do retail purchases, then you should have some KYC over a certain amount because there, there is some money laundering. Like I know it's always Bitcoin and crypto is always thrown into that. Everything's drugs and money laundering. And really, when you look at the data, that's not true. It's really like cash and things like that. They're far worse for it. But one of the things that I I particularly take issue with on, on this kind of stuff is the idea of censorship. I think that's a big thing. Like right now we're in the UK where we don't really have much censorship right now, but you look at other countries and it happens. Everyone likes to give the example of the Canadian truckers, you know, their accounts are frozen. And that's a real example of how custodial arrangements really can go wrong. And it more interesting one that this plays into rather than domestic censorship is the idea of like international censorship, because obviously, you know, cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, it's this global asset across borders. That's one of the most powerful and beautiful things about the whole thing and you have coinbase which is also a multi-international company across the world their headquarters are in the us right and it's all of a sudden if the us says actually we don't like that country over there you better freeze all those accounts coinbase or else we're going to start to screw you over because your headquarters is based here and your employees are based here and you pay tax here well this becomes an issue where we no longer have this idea of this decentralized distributed network with no single point of failure if everyone's going through coinbase and the us government can all of a sudden put the pressure on 
down to Coinbase to start to restrict certain accounts. I'm not saying that's going to happen. And, you know, in some cases, that is a good thing, right? If we can stop terrorism and things like that, that's great. I just think it's something to be aware of when we think about this idea of everyone using Coinbase and these custodians as the only way to exchange crypto. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And ultimately, it comes down to the fact that as soon as you put full trust in a third party like this, then you're also putting your faith in how they sit in the regulatory environment, where they are, whatever jurisdiction mm -hmm. they operate in. And that's always going to be an unknown that can change over time. So yeah, it's definitely an important consideration. So moving on then, what can we do if you don't want to be in that situation, if you want to sacrifice a bit of user experience, add in a bit of friction potentially, but to have more control. So that's where the non-custodial arrangements take place, right? That's the alternative. So what does that mean? Well, typically this is wallets or kind of other software like a Chrome plugin, for example, that basically lets you take full control of your private key. So then you as a user, Alec, maybe you cannot, cannot be trusted <laughs> to, to look after your own private keys. And what he's alluding to here is I had this, which I've talked about previously for those people that are consistent across our episodes and up to date, I had a Kraken wallet. I had 500 pound worth of Bitcoin in there, I think, which I mean, one of those people that's like, oh my God, that's like in 10 years time, that was like a billion pounds worth of Bitcoin that's lost on this Kraken wallet. But I think right now it would have been like 2K or something like that. And yeah, didn't take the, I know it's annoying, didn't take the seed phrase um, should we go into this as well? We should go into this. But effectively, yeah. you know, you have these wallets and they're still run by third party providers, right? It's not like you create your own wallet on your phone. Uh, you still have um, a service provider that creates the wallet. But the point is the software is run on your device. and You're less beholden to the actual company. Everything can kind of be managed on your own device. And one of the most important things of this is when you create your wallet for the security purposes, you effectively create this seed phrase. And the seed phrase is, it's a, a big number, right? It's a number between 128 and 256 bits or something like this. So it's a huge, huge number. And they convert this to a mnemonic because no one's going to be able to write down this number and not make a mistake. So a mnemonic is like basically the word equivalent of that big number, right? And there's pretty good standards for how we do this. And it's like weird numbers like, I don't know, Bible, tree, goat, and things like that in like the sequence, right? I remember the first time I saw it, I was like, what the hell is this? It's like a quiz or something like that. But the point of these mnemonics is they represent that really big random number that represents like everything that kind of controls your wallet and the, and the keys in there. And the mnemonic is more human readable. And we use like very well-known standards for doing this, the BIP standards, which is the bit improvement protocol standards, right, Jack? And effectively, this seed phrase represent is like a it's a cryptographic key. It's the root of all the cryptographic keys in your wallet, effectively. And from this seed phrase, using this thing called um, a hierarchical deterministic wallet, you can produce an infinite number of keys from that seed phrase. Because see Jack nodded along like, yes, I like you've got this. You can do this. Come on, you're nearly <laughs> so, there through the technical stuff. I know, it's, I'm finally getting it. So yeah, your wallet will derive all your private keys and obviously effectively the public keys related to that in a repeatable and consistent way. There's kind of like a defined way of how it will do these things once it's got the seed phrase, meaning that the same seed phrase will always generate the same set of keys in the same order. Okay, so that's quite important. So if I if I lose my phone and lose my wallet on my phone, for example, if I have that seed phrase, I can go to realistically probably any wallet that uses these standards, which is almost every wallet anyway, and I can put that seed phrase into the wallet and the software within the wallet can derive all the private keys and all the transactions by scanning the public keys that are related to those private keys on blockchain to see all the funds linked to that wallet and all the transaction history. And I think that's it, right? <laughs> did, did I get yeah, that right? I hope everyone's still with us. But yeah, that was a technical <laughs> deep dive. I was actually very well explained, I think. It's not easy because there's so many things going on. But yeah, so I, I often think of a wallet as it's basically a collection of private keys, which are these kind of long 256-bit typically numbers. So 256 ones and zeros in a line, that's a random number that you use. But that's your how wallet you dream is as well, isn't it, Jack? <laughs> <laughs> yeah these days at least anyway but as you alluded to your entire wallet because of the standards that have emerged around how you manage wallets your entire wallet is completely derived from a single 256 bit number and mm -hmm. that is what this mnemonic seed phrase is so you map this 256 bits 
to a bunch of words, right? So the first mm. four bits or something will map to Bible and the next four will map to goat. And I won't reveal Alex's entire last phrase <laughs> and read this it episode. Right now. <laughs> but yeah, there, and there's a standard dictionary, right? So if this is the number in the first four bits, then this is the word. That's how it works. And yeah, from that 256 bit number, you can then regenerate all of the keys for all of your assets. And that's very portable in that sense, right? You can take your seed phrase from one wallet to the next, which is another nice thing about the non-custodial arrangement is that you're not locked into a single platform. You can very easily switch between them. And a wallet then, think of your MetaMask, for example, or even like a Coinbase wallet for their non-custodial option or an Exodus. These are all just interfaces where you can input this private key and it will show you then, as you said, all these assets that you manage based on those private keys. So that's what we're talking about with non-custodial. Now, we've talked mostly about software wallets so far as i said the metamasks of the world things that are very easy to use you also have the kind of more tinfoil hat experience of this so you also have the cold wallets which are hardware typically hardware wallets so probably the most famous of these you have the ledger nano s i think is the actual product no sponsorship but you have that <laughs> one you also have the trezor so these are actually physical devices and they are digital but they're physical kind of devices. Think of your physical key that helps you log on to online banking sometimes. I know a lot of people have those and they help people become more confident using online banking. But these are physical devices that effectively store your private keys securely and away from the internet for most of their lifetime, unless you want to go on and make a transaction. Yeah, I mean, if you see someone with these hardware wallets, you know they're serious about this. They're probably a yeah. Bitcoin maxi. And They've got a lot of money. A <laughs> They've got a lot of money. It's some serious business. I'm not at that stage yet. I'm still using Coinbase and losing seed phrases all over the place. But yeah, some of the problems and just considerations around these non-custodial arrangements, obviously, you have to write down these seed phrases and store them somewhere. Otherwise, if you lose your phone like I did, you lose everything associated with that wallet, which is a, a big issue. I think one of the crazy stats that I've seen around this is... A lot of people have lost these seed phrases, right? And I think it's somewhere around 13% of the entire Bitcoin supply has been lost to this kind of issue, to people losing their seed phrases. I don't even know how much money that is right now, but it's a hell of a lot. Yeah, I feel like every single person who has some crypto will know at least one other person who's lost their crypto by forgetting their seed phrase. So, you know, in this in this case, that's that's my Alec. <laughs> the other aspect of this, which is interesting, is because, okay, we're not, no longer are we custodying our keys with a third party, but there is an element of trust typically with another third party, whoever is that third party that's created the wallet, whether it be software or hardware. And a good example of this is a hack that happened with Ledger actually recently. So there was a kind of complex phishing attack launched on an employee at Ledger, and that basically led to the code of one of their products that connected the ledger, you know, as I say, the hot, it's cold normally, but it can connect out if you choose to, to other services, they compromised that code. And that resulted in, again, not huge, but it's still significant. It's around half a million in customer funds lost from that. But it, that, I like this story because it proves you can't just trust mm. it because you have the keys and you think it's safe. You are still sacrificing a little bit of trust in the hardware or the software, especially if the wallet is an open source software, for example, then you can't fully verify how secure, how securely it's storing your assets. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that we want to touch on here as well is we're talking about these kind of, what do you call them, the crown jewel type situations. You have a Coinbase database that has everyone's, potentially everyone's data, everyone's keys in one place. And yeah, there's going to be a hell of a lot of security on that. What's the phrase they use? It's like a mountain vault setup where it's so heavily security that there's no way of getting yeah. it. Yeah. Well, there are the, I think there are these like Swiss mountains, right? Where they store ki Bitcoin keys and they're in like safety there. deposit boxes <laughs> in mountains with, it's like Fort Knox, basically. Fort right, Knox. That's crypto. the kind of thing. People I'm saying, do yeah. do that. Exactly. So we're talking like this Fort Knox setup probably for Coinbase. But the point is, it is crown jewels. There's a lot of people, maybe hackers from international states, shadow states and all this kind of stuff, looking at those keys and being like, wow, there is billions in there. If I just get through that Fort Knox style security, then I've got all access to all these keys. In the self-custodial arrangement, obviously, you're managing your own keys, so your security is much less. It's only the biometric sign-in of your device or your seed phrase that's maybe in a locker somewhere or something like this. But the total assets there is much lower, and if you get compromised, it doesn't mean anyone else gets compromised. So we have this kind of security arrangement where, because funds are distributed across many people, we're a much smaller target, so it's actually probably 
it's probably a benefit to the actual security arrangement because of that, because people working for the KGB or whatever it is aren't going to be hacking my device. I hope not anyway. Probably it now they know now. about my... <laughs> yeah, I was going to say after this episode, maybe they will be. But that's a, probably a pro-security thing for the self-custodial arrangement. Yeah, and I think it's important just to make a quick distinction right now. We're talking about self-custody, which is really a subset of non-custodial, except I think non-custodial things that we talked about before, your hardware, software, wallets, they tend to be digital in some sense. Your self-custody arrangement tends to be purely physical, right? So how does this normally work? Well, people basically, there's a few different options. So some people consider the hardware wallets as pure self-custody, but for the reasons we've just explained, maybe that's not quite true. The actual OG, let's say, self-custody tends to be things like paper wallets. So you literally write down your seed phrase on a piece of paper and then you hide that under the mattress, okay? Or you put that in a safety deposit box. That is quite commonplace, actually, I believe. If you see someone that does this, run away, run far away. <laughs> yeah, or, or, you know, find the seed phrase. But um, <laughs> so either it'll be on a paper wallet I've seen a good technique talked about being to put it on an old phone that you're not using anymore that's not connected to the internet. Again, you have a risk there that the phone won't work when you go and turn it on, so not necessarily recommended. Some people also use these brain wallets. Now, I think these are highly unrecommended, but this is where people literally memorize the seed phrase <laughs> or try and you know build a story around it or something. So it, it sounds funny, but it's true. This does happen. But yeah, this the pure self-custody model is taking it that much further where you basically have zero third party arrangement involved. The idea of this brain wallet's ridiculous, isn't it? I can't even remember my own birthday sometimes. I'm remembering 18 words, goat and it's always goat and Bible, I think. But yeah, like Jack says, the issues here are probably the lowest level of user experience, right? This is for people that don't want to use this very often. There's no third party that's trying to help them to get into their wallet ever. So it is basic as hell, but probably the most secure and the least dependent on anyone if anything's going to happen and like when we think about the hot and cold wallet stuff this is the okay i guess it's probably the most cold of any cold wallet right they're not going to be someone that freezing is, they're looking they're putting the bitcoin away and they're going to look at it in 100 years time or something like that probably so there's a lot of problems that can come about because of this and i think jack's got some stories that he wants to tell us about the consequences of using this kind of setup yeah, well, I mean, there's a very famous story. And as a, a fellow Welshman, I feel like I should tell this one. So again, you may well have heard of this one, but there's a guy called James Howells. So he was, was a Welsh IT worker from Newport and is basically one of the earliest Bitcoin miners. He was involved very, very early, mined some of the earliest blocks in, in, in Bitcoin ever. Now, in 2013, as the story goes, he basically threw away accidentally one of the old hard drives he had, you know, as you do over time which he thinks now contained private keys to some of those early block rewards that he mined. So, you know, literally mining rewards coming directly from blocks now effectively lost. So he thinks he's lost around 8,000 BTC. That's worth around 400 million today as we record this just after the all-time high. So it's a lot of money. Now, currently that, that hard drive, he believes, is sat in a landfill site in Newport that's owned by Newport Council. But He's putting together this huge project. He's got private backing to do this. There's a whole do kind of documentary on it as well, where he's petitioning the council. I want to go and dig up this landfill. I want to use like IoT and robots to scan through the soil to find the hard drive. I, I honestly, this is the case. And he wants to donate 25% of the proceeds back to the local community if they let him do this. But at the minute, it's not happening. But the whole point is, this is the kind of thing that can happen if you go down the pure physical self-custody route, okay? You are responsible. And even someone as experienced and knowledgeable as James, who was you know, there on the ground mining Bitcoin in like 2011, 2012, potentially, it can still happen to them. It can happen to the best of us, right? Yeah, I'd love to get James on because this is such an incredible story. I think the kind of the attempt to recover is probably as interesting as the fact that he lost it in the first mm -hmm. place, right? I think some of the things that I saw that he was trying to get to is this highly specialized team of like robot dogs, artificial intelligence powered machines, specifically for identifying hard drives. There's so much tech going into this. He wanted 24 hour CCTV across the entire patrol mm -hmm. and all, so to make sure there's no unauthorized searches because obviously as he gets closer and closer, people are thinking, what I've got to do is take this hard drive from this landfill and i've got 400 million pound potentially but i saw yeah. that the council wouldn't approve it because there's obviously ecological and legal concerns about him digging through people's stuff right yeah exactly so it, it, as you say it's a great story and i think the whole the take-home message here is that the more 
self-custodial you go because again this is really a spectrum from pure custodial to, to fully self-custodial is a big spectrum of options in between but the more you take responsibility for your own assets the bigger the risks that you are obviously incurring upon yourself right another issue with the whole self-custody thing as you alluded to earlier it's not really necessarily in the interest of cryptocurrency in general right because the more self-custodial you go the less likely you are to actually use it if your stuff is if your coins are stored on this paper wallet, you're not going to dig that out and use it every day. So it, it goes back to this hodling mentality, right? Just holding the assets, hoping it will moon coming back in 20 years. And it's not for this utility usage of payments for, for data, for anything. It's not really on that. So I think it's not necessarily great for crypto in general, but yeah, you can see why people do it as well. Yeah, it makes sense. We've always said that we're proponents of utility and we want to see like these cryptocurrencies potentially replacing fiat to an extent because with this, there's so many benefits to it. And we're kind of seeing the CBDCs go down that route where these the CBDCs, whether you're pro or against them, like what we've seen so far from the projects and pilots that are out there is they won't be interest bearing. So they're not going to be, you're not going to be able to use these things as investment and hodl assets, right? In a lot of the cases, especially in the UK, the, the pound, digital pound scenario, sorry. But they are focused focus quite heavily on either retail or wholesale so actual utility coming from this and it's a shame because that should have been that should have been what crypto is, is doing and hopefully will do but yeah you are right i understand why they're doing it right at the end of the day most people want to make money and it seems like hodling these kind of cryptocurrencies and assets is a way of making money but yeah i hope they also yeah. eventually get used for the peer-to-peer -peer cash system that we're planning so let's do a little bit of a review like we, we always say this isn't financial advice we're techies and we've been around this and i've made a lot of mistakes so you, you want to learn from some of the mistakes i've made if you are going to do this kind of stuff we've talked at a really high level about what each of the the scenarios and options are custodial we said they're very web two, easy to use single points of failure in a lot of ways but like we say they're, they're good for people that are moving into this space for the first time but really do your research on the exchange look at the breaches look at how heavily regulated they are make sure they've got guarantees and all this kind of stuff but do your research before just going to any old exchange because you don't want to end up like those poor people that invested in ftx and had the assets stored in ftx right because they lost a lot of money yeah exactly and, and again just be aware of the risks i think this is more security advice even with an FTX, which lots of people told you was a great place to use and was perfectly safe, ended up being a really bad place to put your assets. So, you know, you always have to assume the worst potentially when you're using these things and just be aware of, of the risks associated. You can also check for any guarantees they might provide. I'm aware of some exchanges beginning to offer things like insurance products. So there is a company called CoinCover who provides this insurance product two exchanges so they will ensure assets up to a certain amount i think maybe you have to opt in pay slightly more but if you're really worried about these risks then taking out an insurance policy is also a really good idea you can also look out for exchanges in the custodial model that are using some of those multi-party techniques right where you have more mm -hmm. checks and balances on how the assets are used so that's definitely something to look out for in the non-custodial or self-custody world again the headline is about securely back, backing up your seed phrases. Mm -hmm. So don't just put it in your iPhone notes or something, as I know lots of people have done. Don't stick it in an email or something. Be much more careful about where you back these things up. Again, typically it, it might well be more secure if you back it up on something physical. You can also use a password manager. That kind of thing is very commonplace now. Yeah, learn from my failures. And I think like we talked about the UX traditionally being quite poor on these solutions, but it's getting better. And I think if we look to the kind of the future of this space, like I've seen a lot of work going on and projects going on right now around the idea of removing these mnemonics, removing these seed phrases and linking that 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 kind of core key, that core number that we talked about originally to biometrics. As we all know, it's so easy to get onto your phone by just scanning your fingerprint. And a lot of people attest to that being a very high security standard, right? So why not have a way to link our fingerprint to our wallets instead? And assu assuming that won't go wrong, right? Um, that would be the best case scenario of a high UX. And also you get the, the kind of the non-custodial approach as well. But a big assumption. <laughs> <laughs> so that obviously assumption. there are other issues you might introduce there but i think again it's going to be up to everyone's individual preference right some people will be more than happy to use biometrics like as we do with banking people use mm -hmm. biometrics to confirm their banking transactions uh, you're completely right in the future people will do the same thing with their, their backup phrases for their crypto so yeah i think looking to the future you know i don't know if there's necessarily that much happening right now in this world in terms of changes apart from what you said right trying to remove seed phrases that's probably the biggest trend i've seen and there's lots of clever people working on that but i guess more broadly you also have a lot more scrutiny now on the centralized exchanges 
given what's happened with FTX and, and Binance. So I think in the future, you'll they're likely to become more trustworthy because they know there's more regulatory action coming their way if they do have a big failing, right? So that's a good thing. And I also think the way that the lawmakers are, are starting to apply, I mean, in the UK in particular, classifying crypto assets as property in a legal sense is a really good step forward because, again, they're clarifying the other side of that, not your keys, not your coins argument. And that will hopefully drive exchanges to have more obligations to to reimburse people that lose money when things go wrong, I think. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of people moving into this space. And importantly, a lot of kind of, like you say, regulatory certainty coming in with big institutions coming in as well. And that's exciting. I think the exchanges are going to come more and more under the thumb. Regulators are starting to catch up, as you've said. And that is a good boon for everyone that wants to use some of these kind of more custodial approaches. And like you say, it's beautiful that a lot of this, the non-custodial approaches are be kind of focusing more and more on the UX and trying to just be a Web2 platform as much as possible with all the Web3 underpinnings. So that that is quite exciting. But I guess, yeah, the main message is do your research, stay safe out there and write those seed phrases down somewhere and don't lose them. <laughs> Don't follow Alex's example. That's our main <laughs> message today. Do what I say, not what I do. And yeah, this has been a good episode then. And I guess thank you to listening wherever you may be and join us next time as we untangle a little more of Web3. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Untangling Web3, produced by Emma Camilleri. Don't forget to send us your thoughts, questions, and comments on social media. And be sure to follow us on your favorite podcast provider to catch the next episode. See you next time to untangle a little bit more of Web3. The views we express here are our own and do not reflect the views of our employers.